thank you everybody for joining. I'm gonna go into slideshow mode. I hope everybody can see the screen. Let me get into slideshow mode. And then uh, this today we're gonna talk about, you know, how does one choose, you know, the right college? And this is not just about Googling and saying, you know, show me the top 10 universities or, you know, whatever, right? So we wanna talk a little bit more uh, from our expertise and from our experience of, you know, doing this for the past 10, 11 years or so, okay? So the way I want to do this is if you have any questions, uh, do go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. If you raise your hand, I'll try and see, but I might or might not be able to spot you. So it may be better just to unmute yourself and then ask your question, okay? And uh, I have about 10, 11 slides I wanna go through. And then, as I mentioned, interrupt me. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And then at the end, of course, I'll open it up for Q&A in case I have not covered things that you might have been looking for, okay? So let's get going now. And in the meantime, uh, please mute yourself because there will always be some background noise which we wanna try and avoid. We are recording this session. So um, in case you need that, you can always look at this later again, okay? So let's get started. So what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna talk about some myths about colleges that uh, most parents and students also have and hopefully demystify those things. And then uh, what factors go into choosing a college, we'll cover that. And then uh, of course, you know, why Ivy's, you know, Ivy Leagues and MIT, Stanford, Caltech, why are they so sought after? I mean, what is it about them that appeals to people? Is that justified or not? And then what are liberal arts colleges? I don't know if some of you may have heard, a lot of you may have heard the term liberal arts, but we'll explain what it really means and what it doesn't mean. Public versus private universities. And then, uh, you know, generally this presentation is gonna have a US bent for obvious reasons because majority of the uh, people that come to us and the majority of people that we do help with counseling and college applications, their favorite destination still remains to be the US. But we will talk about other options outside the US. And then uh, of course, everybody's favorite topic, COVID. How is that affecting college education and what will change? What can you expect to see in the near future? Not that I have a crystal ball, but uh, this is purely, you know, again, from our experience and then what we're seeing and how people are reacting to COVID. All right, okay, so let's go. Um, it's about college. So one of the things I hear a lot about, uh, you know, they say, okay, if the college I want to go to is not in the top 30, then it's not worth going. And that's definitely a myth. And uh, if you talk about US, right, which, which as I mentioned before, we're going to talk about a lot about that. Uh, that's definitely not true because there are at least 100 colleges which offer you great education. So, uh, you know, IVs are not the only place to be. And uh, we'll hear more about that as we go along. And then uh, bad GPA, meaning high school GPA, can be made up for, meaning compensated for, by doing a lot of extra activities, extracurricular activities and stuff. That's a myth as well. GPA still rules. That's your number one uh, criterion in terms of what colleges look for. So don't fall into that trap. And then, you know, some people, I have had parents come and say, you know, well, I have a friend I grew up with, he's a professor at MIT or Stanford or UCLA, whatever, right? And he said it'd get me in, so uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. And then I'll get into one major and then switch to the one I really want, right? So that's sometimes possible, but sometimes it's not. If anybody has a question that I can explain more, but um, you know, basically that's not the best strategy. And then, you know, there's a, some kind of myth that, you know, hey, nobody reads your essays, don't worry about them. Or something like, hey, get someone else to write for you. Uh, both are wrong. And the latter one is terrible. I hope uh, nobody does that. I know people do, but that's really not a good idea. 
And then there's a myth that potential employers, right, once you're in college, don't care about your college GPA. They actually do. That may not be the entire basis for their hiring you, but it does matter. And then repeating a course will replace my previous bad grade. It does not. Your bad grade still remains. Your new grade will just add to it. And then your overall GPA is computed. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about what factors into college selection. I mean, what do people look for and what do we think, we as in USO? So of course, um, you know, before you really look at colleges, one of the things USO advises is that what do you want? Meaning you as an individual, you as a student, you as a high school junior, senior, whatever, right? Because everybody's needs are different. So there is no one size fits all. Everybody, there is a college out there for each one of you, right? And Google is not the way to go about it. It is quite subjective. In fact, the reason we're even talking about this whole thing, you know, the topic of the webinar being, is it art or science is exactly that. If it were 100% science, then we wouldn't need this seminar, right? So think about what do you wanna get out of it, right? There are several factors. I mean, do you want to go to grad school immediately or you want to go a little bit later? Uh, what kind of major do you want? Um, what kind of career do you want? And you know, the ge geographic location of the college also matters, right? So you really want to sit down and ask yourself or sit down with your parents and say, look, what do I want to get out of college? That's a more important question than saying, you know, what college do you want to go to, okay? Now, of course, ranking, everybody says, oh, you know, geez, we got to look at ranking, you know, US News said this, somebody else said that kind of stuff. Of course, it's everybody's favorite. There, I have one more slide on this because I think it's very important not to get hung up on that. And then, of course, cost factors into it, right? Education is becoming more and more expensive, um, you know, whether it's US or UK or anywhere for that matter. So cost does matter. And then choice of major, what do you want to study? What is the course you want to choose? That does matter as well. And then the faculty, research, internship opportunities, you know, I don't know how many people really look at this because as I mentioned, most of the time, parents and students get hung up on the ranking. Was there a question? If, we, if no question, please mute yourself. Thank you. And then uh, class size actually matters, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. And then there are certain consortia, right? So a group of colleges that kind of work as one, like a virtual university, not exactly like one. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And then employment opportunities post-graduation, that's very important because if you're going to go spend a significant amount of money, I mean, you want to make sure that after you graduate, whatever college you go to, whatever course you choose, is going to make you employment eligible, right? So that also matters, okay? Now, before I get into this, uh, let me pause for a minute and ask you guys, are there any questions about what we covered so far? No, sir. Okay. All right, so what about rank? Everybody's favorite topic, right? So does rank matter? Yes and no, right? So what do I mean by that? So let's do a little trivia, okay? How many of the top 10 so the companies, the top 10 companies by revenue, not by market cap, right? Top 10 CEOs, how many of them do you think graduated or undergrad school, do you think they went to an Ivy League? I'm putting Ivy in quotes because I don't mean just the eight Ivies, but I'm also talking about MIT, Stanford, Caltech, Duke, um, Chicago, Northwestern, blah, blah, blah kind of stuff. So. Uh, anybody want to take a uh, swag at this? How many of the top 10 CEOs, right? Top 10 companies, CEOs by revenue, do you think graduated from an Ivy League or one of the top 20 schools? Six. Six of the 10? Okay. 
more three okay so three okay from the 10 top companies you're saying only three of them graduated from an ib okay others none come on there's no downside to this 10 10 out of 10 okay fine all right so who said three kanisha okay it's actually one okay so nine of them did not go to a quote unquote ivy league school okay that is an amazing statistic because we all get so hung up on i got to go to one of these schools to be able to get a job i got to go there i got to go here no right now i am not saying certainly that rank doesn't matter but i just want you to know that putting all your eggs in the rank basket is not a good thing okay so 9 out of 10 ceos did not go to one of these top schools okay now trivia 2 which college or university produced the most number of ceos in the top 50 companies i think this is a tough one you guys probably won't get this but it's texas a and m okay there are four people in the top 50 companies who are running those companies as ceos amazing isn't it because when you make your college list i have a feeling texas a and m won't be number 1 2 3 or 4 for that matter unless you're looking for something specific right or you have other reasons like you have family in texas or something like that so you know the reason i wanted to highlight this is because you know again let's not get hung up on the wrong things okay all right let's continue now so what matters remember i said i'm not saying rank doesn't matter right rank does matter but what matters more is your grade point average in the four years you're there you know particularly if you want to go to medical school or go to grad school i mean in general gpa matters more okay because companies also when they want to hire you right because they will look at some project work you may have you may have done you may have done some internships but you know gpa is your their way of measuring you right rank matters but what major you studying matters more because you can go to some school a top rank school and then you know major in basket weaving or something it's not going to do much for you right so the course definitely matters rank matters but internships and research matter even more right get some experience rank matters but a well rounded education matters even more we'll talk about that a little bit more in the coming slides so ultimately rank matters but you matter more right what you do the advantage that you take off you know in terms of the offerings from any university how well you do in your grades in your internships in your recommendation letters all those matter a lot more than just rank okay all right so then the question right so why are people so crazy about ivs you know again remember i'm putting ivs in quotes because i'm also including mit and stanford and you know all those big guns right so why why do people care about them so much right so generally um, especially on the east coast those colleges or universities are the oldest okay so they're most well known and for that reason you know they have most money and they can do a lot more with things right so the most nobel laureates right come from these universities so harvard has 160 MIT has 97, Columbia has 96. Those are big numbers, right? And then they have large endowments. Harvard has 40 billion dollars, Stanford 27, Yale 27, right? That's serious money. And then usually one difference here, and this is probably something that works in favor of top colleges or these, you know, so-called Ivies, quote-unquote Ivies, is because. since everybody wants to go whether it's a good reason or a bad reason it ends up being that the people that do get in they're toppers from their respective high school so you know maybe a valedictorian or a head boy in indian terms right so these are the guys that get in and of course when these people once they go to college you know they're still trying to be number 1 and not everybody's going to succeed at being number 1 but the competition is very intense right so as a result 
you do go through a more severe and more serious grind going through these top universities, right? By the same token, it doesn't mean that a 30th ranked university doesn't have toppers, but not everybody is a topper. Maybe 30% of them are toppers. Maybe others are slightly less than that, right? But that is one thing the IVs have going for them. And brand value, of course, we've been drilled into our heads that, you know, brand matters. And I think, you know, Asian culture, Indians, Chinese, right? We value that even more than others in terms of, you know, you got to, you know, where did you go to college kind of stuff, right? So that does matter. And then when you go to an Ivy or one of these top universities, you do get to build a big network. Remember, I talked about how most of the people getting in are toppers. So if I'm majoring in computer science, then, you know, let's assume I'm not, but let's say I'm a topper, right? So I go and then I'm doing computer science, but I'm able to make connections with people who are doing pre-med or robotics or law, pre-law, et cetera, right? Because these are all toppers. So by the time I graduate, I do have a very good network of people who more often than not end up going someplace, right? And then the alumni do band together. There is a bigger loyalty in terms of you know, these big names. So the alumni do help each other a lot more than let's say something that's ranked number 40 or 45 or something like that. Now that it's not a good college. In fact, the infrastructure and the quality of professors and the faculty is, is the same at UC Davis, which is you know, in the top 30, top 35, but definitely not in the top 10 or 15, as you might see at any other university in the, in the Ivies, okay? But the alumni do band together, right? Now, one other thing is that some professions, specifically law and uh, MBAs, right? They depend a lot more on branding than perhaps a technology profession, right? And one of the reasons is obviously because in technology, the demand far outstrips the supply, right? And then there, you know, like if you're talking about robotics or machine learning or computer science or whatever, it's easier to do, you know, whether it's an internship or, you know, a summer job or whatever, it's easier to get than in law, okay? Or business especially, right? Because that's a lot more theory and it's very difficult to convert that into practice, okay? But some professions do depend on branding a lot more than some other professions. Okay. All right. So um, let me pause once more and see if there are any questions on anything that we've talked about so far. Okay. Let me move on then. So liberal arts colleges. So what are these? Right. It's actually a misnomer when they say liberal arts colleges. See, these colleges got this name yeah. based on their history, right? Because Remember, if you go back 200 years ago, right, women were not allowed to go to college, right? So these started off as women-only colleges long time ago. By the way, there are still a few which are women-only colleges, right? Uh, the liberal arts colleges. So what they did, obviously, being women's only colleges, right? So they were more into, you know, liberal arts subjects, right? History, uh, literature, and things like that. That's how they got their name. Right, but now they offer more or less all the majors that any other college does. Right, so that's a misnomer, but the name stuck. Right, now quite a number of them, and some of you may have heard about one or two of these. Right, many are ranked among top in the nation. So if you Google, if you want Williams College or Pomona College, Amherst or Swarthmore, I mean these guys are up there. Right, they compete with the Ivies and some of the better colleges. Um, these are smaller colleges, right? But they are highly ranked and they do offer many of the majors that the bigger ones do. So they offer smaller class sizes and they claim that most of their teachers are PhDs as opposed to the bigger colleges like University of California or Michigan or UT Austin. If you think about these colleges, right? So many of the time, 
um, it's not uh, classes are not taught by professor. They might come and do a lecture for a huge class, but then they're there to research. They're there to publish papers. They're not there to teach. So the small colleges, the liberal arts colleges, claim that 80%, 90% of our teachers are actually PhDs, and then that you will get more attention. The class size may be as small as 15, sometimes 10, right? So that's something, you know, if you are looking for something like that, you may want to think about it. Now, they, as I mentioned just now, they do offer all the majors, right? But they do not offer a variety within the same major as the big ones do, right? So like in biology, a large university might offer four or five different flavors and a small school or a liberal arts college might offer two, right? That's the one drawback. And they focus mostly on offering undergraduate programs that do not usually typically offer grad programs. And then some of them do have, as I mentioned before, a consortia. Um, for example, Claremont McKenna uh, Consortium has about five colleges. So does the Amherst, you know, well, University of Massachusetts at Amherst is different from Amherst College. Amherst College is a liberal arts school. Then they have three other colleges, you know, which are women only. Right, some of them are very popular, and then people can take classes across these five. Right, so that's another advantage you have for small colleges. And then uh, they have the same infrastructure and same quality of faculty as large universities. So that's a misnomer, also, or a misunderstanding on the part of many students that think that oh, the bigger universities have better faculties. Now they might, but those are not the guys coming and teaching you especially not at the undergrad level, especially not at the freshman or sophomore years, right? So that's something to keep in mind. And then there are some other small colleges um, which are not called liberal arts colleges because they're small by design, but they offer very technical majors also, right? So WPI is the Wooster Polytechnic Institute, very well known for engineering type uh, programs, especially robotics. And then uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic, same thing, computer science. So one of the advantages they do claim, and it's true, is that the smaller colleges do a little bit more handholding, right? Because they are competing with the big names and know that. So they'll be able to find you internships. They do have relationships with local colleges and stuff. And another one is Harvey Mudd, which is one of the colleges in the Claremont Consortium. These are very, you know, Harvey Mudd in particular is a very, very difficult colleges to get in. The WPI and RPI, not so much, but they're excellent colleges as options if you're looking for a small technical college, okay? It doesn't have to be a big name. And unfortunately, as I mentioned before, our culture promotes, you know, ranks a lot more than the quality. And as I mentioned in the beginning, look for what you want, right? So what you want and what I find in a college may not be the same thing that you find in the same college, okay? Any questions so far? Please, as I mentioned, do interrupt. Okay, so small colleges are best when you know exactly what you want. So what I mean by that is remember, if you're not decided on a major or if you say, I think it's sciences, but I'm not sure what it is, it's better to choose a bigger college, a large college, because as I mentioned before, they have many flavors, and then it's easier to change majors in larger colleges, right? So it's not surprising that at least in the US, you know, when students are applying from the United States, almost 50% of them do not declare their major or change their majors within the first year, right? Because they don't expect you to know exactly what you want. That's quite different culturally. Again, you know, in India, you know, by the time you're in seventh or eighth grade, you're supposed to know what you want to do or what you want to be, right? That's not the case there. So it's, it's not only okay to change majors, it's actually encouraged. So find what you want, you know, chase passion and not admission is what we say, right? So, but on the other hand, if you know, look, I know exactly what I want. I want to do economics then I don't have a chance of you know, changing, I'm not gonna think about it, then the smaller colleges might be a very good option to consider, okay? All right, continuing, so what about public versus private universities? 
right? So uh, public university, universities are generally large universities, institutions, right? When I say large, I'm talking about the student body size. For example, UC Berkeley has around 30,000 full-timers. So does Michigan, uh, UT Austin may be even bigger, right? So they're generally large. Now, private schools, private colleges can be big, generally not as big. Uh, there's quite a number of them which are medium, but some of them are very small. So when I say small, we're talking about 2,000 entire student population, right? So that's a small number, uh, 2,000 to 4,000, et cetera, right? That's almost like somebody's high school here, okay? So they can be very small, and we talked about the liberal arts colleges as being one of the examples. And then public schools are funded by the respective state government. That's why they're called public schools. So they do have certain rules they have to live by. Um, there is no quota system per se in the US or most places um, outside India, right? But they do want um, a diverse student body, so does a private university, but a public university obviously has to be more sensitive to that, right? So they do take in people who may not be on par with toppers, right? But just to diversify and the fact that they're being funded by the state government, you know, it can look in this as a positive or a negative, it's up to you, but they do have a more diverse body. And then public school also is expected to be more transparent in terms of how they do their admissions process and stuff because they do have to live by the government rules. Private universities don't have to disclose and some of you may have been following the big case that has been going on. Um, I think it's settled now. Somebody sued Harvard uh, for um, you know, saying that I had better grades but I wasn't you know, allowed to, to attend there, et cetera. There was some racism claims and all that kind of stuff, right? So private schools are not as transparent. And then I just mentioned, you know, public schools do accommodate the low income or the minorities a lot more. Now, doesn't mean that private schools don't, right? They do have, some of the schools have, you know, need blind scholarships, et cetera, but you do have to qualify in terms of your academics and all those things they look at, right? So the minorities by definition, many of them don't have the advantages of going to you know, top high schools and stuff. So they, they do have a disadvantage there. Now, if you're an in-state resident, whether it's California, New York, or Florida, it doesn't matter. The first option, usually people look for public schools because it's much cheaper to go there, right? But doesn't mean always the case, right? Some may be looking for the quality or some may have a specific college they wanna to go to, which may not be within the state. Right, so that's an option as well. You know, when you're in state, that's a good option. If not, you have other options as well. Now, large public schools, as I mentioned, are very, very crowded, right? You may not always get the class you want, when you want it, etc. Eventually you will get it, right? As you become a junior and senior, you do get priority. But smaller schools do claim that that's not a problem and they do have more uh, counselors that can work with you, whereas a large public university due to lack of funding or whatever, they may have like one counselor per, I'm just picking a number, right? 200 or 300 students. So it makes it very difficult to get their help, right? So you're kind of more on your own when you go to a large public school, but you know, it's a trade-off, right? Okay, so uh, one more pause. Ask any questions at this point? Nothing? All right, let's look at a couple of options outside US, right? So, I mean, you have UK, I just listed some colleges there, doesn't mean these are the only colleges, right? Canada is an option, especially these days, people are looking to Canada. Singapore. Australia, right? See, the main thing is all these colleges are not bad colleges, okay? Obviously, Oxford, Cambridge are very well known, so is LSE and McGill, et cetera, right? So NUS competes with the best, right? The only problem is all these countries have a very small number of good universities, whereas the US 
has a large number of good universities and of course the, you know if you talk about the economy of any of these countries compared to the us it's very 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 small right so what does it translate to is obviously number of jobs and things like that however um you know us still does dominate as we we're just talking about right quality or quantity now still there may be other reasons in this day and age during this current time why somebody want to might want to explore other countries right these reasons you know dominating couple of reasons are you know immigration because of you know donald trump and some of the things you know we keep reading about and stuff even though i mean he's not going to be there forever you know even if he gets be elected that's going to be about four years right so um and you know things it's a pendulum in the us it always happens conservatives versus liberals you know things to change but now they've changed quite a bit right so that's one reason people are looking at it other countries and also work permits um you know us for international students doesn't allow um students to work while they are in um, in college you know other than doing that you know like one summer internship or something but you need permission for that and all that so whereas like canada australia and even uk um you can actually work while you're a student and there are some guidelines of course but you can actually work so that's another reason people might be looking at you know paying for some of that expensive education through work permits okay so there these are the reasons um india has a few options as well i mean obviously for uh, non indian citizens you know they have certain quotas you know triple it bits uh, there are other colleges right they do take the sat subjects sats and all that there is one more university that has come up more recently in the last few years it's called ashoka university they're trying to model that um you know just like a us university or a western university you know giving you options and all that but it's going to take some time for it to evolve into a world class university but they're trying right so there are some options in india as well all right so uh, the last topic is right so what about covid what is covid going to do to higher education you know is that something we should be worried about how is that going to work right so now as you guys are aware not only many colleges but i think all of your high schools have gone online right so that that's a fact it's happened already and colleges are doing the same and then uh, moocs will become more prevalent right massive open online courses is what the mooc stands for they've been around for a while right and then many people take advantage of them there are certain limitations right so they don't give you degree and stuff based on that but the whole point was to make quality education quality courses available to everyone i think that's going to become more prevalent and more critical in a student's life there's going to be more collaboration between institutions maybe because of distance maybe you know university a might want to use university b's you know infrastructure classrooms or whatever because of local reasons or something like that so it's going to be more collaboration and of course which you're experiencing now right so most kids are very unhappy today when i'm talking about high school kids and a lot of you are on the call today um socialization is not happening and that's very frustrating but you know i think the word socialization and friendship and what you do is going to get redefined in the near future it's already happening right so that is at risk i think there's more technology innovation that's going to happen right along with teachers must be trained to teach online which is a different game altogether than teaching face to face and then i think you know wherever you have a large classroom like the narayana chaitanya fitjis of the world they're going to be facing this much more then a class size of let's say 30 people right but still 30 is still a lot of people online you guys for example our classes are only 10 right so we can even turn on the entire video for everybody we try to get to know each other and things like that but we're not a school in the strict definition right so teachers have to be retrained they have to work harder they have to take more sessions of smaller classes right 
it's a big change for them too. Then, you know, students, even in high school, not just college, right, you have to adapt to online platforms. That's a, that's going to be the future, right? So, I mean, we all hope that a vaccine for COVID-19 is coming soon, right? Soon might be as much as a year away, right? But really, we have to ask ourselves, will we ever get back to ground zero, right? Will ever things go back to the way they were? Right. My guess is it's only a guess. Probably not. I think there's going to the education system is going to change. It may not change, you know, completely, but it's going to be a hybrid where there's going to be more and more reliance on online as well as tools and applications um, where people can do things on their own and on their own time. In fact, it might surprise you to know. There's a lot, a lot of students, especially in large universities, that don't go to classes regularly. <clears throat> and this has nothing to do with COVID, right? So a lot of universities, what they do is automatically, within an hour or less of a class ending, that lecture is put online, right? So what students are doing is, you know, maybe they're working part-time or they're doing something else or whatever they're doing, then they go look at those lectures at their own pace on time because the quiz and everything is also online right so it's happening now so covid has only made it more acute right in terms of online and different way of studying and getting educated but the online especially education is already finely tuned for the online platform so let's hope for the vaccine if no other reason because we're tired of you know, the unemployment and then the poor are suffering even more, right? So we all hope that, but as far as education itself is concerned, will it ever get back to normal? I am not so sure. Maybe normal is not even the word. There's gonna be a new normal, right? So what that is, it's anybody's guess, but my thinking is there is gonna be some kind of hybrid where you will have, just recently UC Davis announced that they'll be doing a combination of in person as well as online courses right so that's already happening the hybrid i mentioned right so the online has many many conveniences that we can't deny right but it does have some irritating features right which is obviously for a high schooler many kids have admitted to me one of the main reasons sometimes the only reason they go to school is to meet their friends right so if that's not happening, then schools really have a problem. They have to be concerned. What value are we really adding? How can we add value? Then parents are going to start to wonder, you know, why are we paying so much, right? So there's a change coming, right? Nothing to be worried about, especially not if you're a student, right? But I do want to caution you that this is not a temporary change, right? The change may not be this drastic forever, but things are going to be different. Things are going to evolve and maybe, hopefully, for the better. Okay. All right. So, um, last trivia question. Anybody want to guess where does this particular professor with these qualifications? I want to read the qualifications, right? So BA in chemistry, magna cum laude at Cornell. PhD in organic chemistry, MIT. And then as you can read, Oxford University is also there. So the reason I wanted to put this up is many times, right? We all think that the best teachers and the best professors only belong in the IVs or MIT or Stanford, right? Remember, I told you, right? Top 100 universities have excellent professors, excellent infrastructure. I'm talking primarily about the US, but that number is gonna be much lower in other countries, right? So um, this person actually works at Boston University, right? Which may or may not make the top 30 or top 35, right? So just to underscore my point, what you do matters a lot more than where you go to college. Now, again, let me repeat myself. I'm not saying that brand doesn't matter. Now, if you can go 
to Stanford and then still go through the grind and, you know, get through it and all that. Hey, more power because brand does matter, as I mentioned, because of the reasons, the networking and the alumni, the strength of the alumni and all that. But what I'm also saying is that Stanford's acceptance rate is what? Four and a half percent. Many of the IVs are around 10 percent, right? So, uh, by the way, some of these uh, liberal arts colleges are less than 10% also, okay? So, it's really more important to look at what do you want to get out of college and then which college or which set of colleges are going to offer that to me, right? So, this is, you know, I put this up because, and this is only one example. Many of the colleges, many universities, the top 40, top 50, whatever, will have this kind of person, you know, or people teaching you, right? So um, don't get hung up on the ranking too much. Ranking, at least from a UASO perspective, when we choose colleges for our students, it's only one of the things we do take that with a grain of salt. There are many other things that go into it. Okay. This is my last slide. So choosing the right college, art or science, you know, the answer is probably a combination of both. Right, I tend to think it's more art than science, but there is definitely a science piece to it. Okay, if you want to know more, or if you have other friends um, who want to know more about this, you can call us or go send us an email at info at uaslearning.com or go to uaslearning.com and we have listed our phone numbers there. You can talk to us, uh, we do offer a free consultation for uh, 30 minutes in terms of, you know, college admissions and things like that. And then uh, if you think we're the right people to help you, then obviously we'll uh, do our best to help you. Okay. So um, any questions at this point? So we're basically at the end of our webinar, at least my portion of it, right? So let me ask you guys, um, any questions, anything that I have not covered that's on your mind, please go ahead and ask. How much does your undergrad affect your postgrad admission? Um, quite a bit. Um, again, it depends on what you want to study in postgrad. Okay. For instance, you know, technically, if you want to do, do like, you know, medicine in the US, right? So you don't do, unlike in India or UK or many of these countries, right? So where you can do medicine right after you finish high school in the US, you have to do what's called a pre-med and that can be anything, right? So for something like that, right? So your uh, grades matter a lot, right? That's one of the biggest components. Uh, but if you want to do postgrad in general, your grades do matter because that is at that point, they're not looking at your experience. If your experience includes something that's going to directly help you in your postgrad, yes, right? But otherwise, your um, undergrad grades and, you know, the, the school doesn't matter as much. So you will notice many times in, in my own philosophy is that for undergrad, you, the ranking and all the reasons I gave you is not that critical. However, uh, when you go to grad school, right, you're choosing something very specific because when you go to undergrad, you're doing, let's say you take, you know, 60 courses throughout four years, right? Only 30 of them are in your major. The rest of them are in other things like, you know, you have an opportunity to take philosophy, sociology, psychology, economics, etc., as a computer science major, for instance, right? But when you go to grad school, you're doing something very specific. You know, maybe uh, you want to work under a professor that's doing something very specific to some economics program or, you know, he's, he's published a book or something, you want to work with him, right? So it's that specific, right? So at that point, you really need to have a resume that says you're going to be able to handle that. So in that case, the, where you go to grad school does matter more than where you go to undergrad, right? So they're not the ranking as much, but your grades, your coursework, and your GPA and all that does matter when you go to grad school. Any other questions? Uh, 
another question for me. Sure. Uh, if you're doing your undergrad, right, and you mm -hmm. want to switch into, uh, let's say, non-academic field, right? Like a I'm vocational sorry, if field, you want to switch into what? Into like a vocational school or okay, okay, things like that. Does that mm -hmm. affect anything or is it going to be focused more on your high school years, like a trade school and things like that? Mm, so you're talking about you will join college and then change to a vocational school? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that would be a factor is your visa status. So if you are a U.S. citizen and you're going to study in the U.S. or if you're a U.K. citizen and studying in the U.K., right? So the visa is not a factor, right? So um, if that is the case, then of course you can do that. You know, some people, you know, I don't know how many of you saw the movie Goodwill Hunting, right? So the, uh, even beyond that, there's a lot of debate about, you know, what is the real value of a college education, right? So there are people that said, you know what, I'm really not learning that much. And then whatever I'm learning here, I know I'm not gonna use it in my job, right? So those people, if they can, you know, the visa situation notwithstanding, yeah, definitely they can go and, and do that. Um, now, of course, you know, if you want to continue to grad school, that might present a problem because you want to do grad, that means you have to have finished your undergrad. But purely from a skill perspective, it's not going to matter so much. Okay. Any others? Nothing. So does the city also matter a lot when you're choosing the college? Like if the bigger the city, more the internships or something like that? Not necessarily, but uh, it, it's more dependent on what your course of study is, right? So for instance, I mean, let's face it, if you're gonna study computer science or anything related to high tech, then you probably wanna be in or around Silicon Valley. Right? At a minimum, you want to be in California, right? But there are certain colleges in California which are good and they're not in Silicon Valley itself, but within, you know, shorting distance, right? So that is what matters more, right? And then if you're going to be doing economics or finance or business and stuff, then, you know, not to say that, you know, other big cities don't matter as much, but New York is probably, you know, going to be very helpful boston you know chicago san francisco right so at the same time right so if you go to the right school i'm not saying the top school the right school um, many times um, companies do come and recruit even for summer internships right so you don't have to be near the company studying near the company but you can still go to your internships at those companies because they come and recruit you and many many if not all of the big companies have a college recruiting program. I ran one of those when I was working for Sun Microsystems. And then I recruited about 20 people from various universities. And, uh, you know, many of them I chose. In fact, a number of them I opted not to choose from the top colleges, including Berkeley. I was working in Silicon Valley, but I did not choose from Berkeley or Stanford. Not always. I did choose one or two, but oftentimes I went with the philosophy that I'm just preaching now where the work they did, the grades they had, and then the internships they did, and the attitude they showed, right? That mattered more to me, and I chose them over some of the top schools like CMU, right? So yes, it does matter to some degree, but it varies from student to student and major to major. Uh, so one more question for me. Mm -hmm. um, considering how big Greek life is, if you don't want to be a part of it, does it have a huge impact on your main college life? No, it doesn't. In fact, um, many campuses have banned, uh, banned these you know, associations, fraternities, sororities and stuff because they think it's, it's a distraction, right? So I personally think it should not be banned. It should be left to the students, but you know, it does not have any impact on you, your social life or anything like that, right? But there are some things, some good things about some of these houses, if you want to call them that, right? But there are other organizations also. There is, for example, there's women in tech, 
might be one organization uh, where you're going to college and that's probably a good thing to go even if you're majoring in business right because tech is affecting every major every field so it's not a bad thing to make those connections for example right and there may be some kind of minorities kind of stuff right so um it, it's good to connect right but purely from quote unquote greek life perspective they came up because of just socializing and stuff so i don't think you lose much if you don't participate in those okay sir thank you sure all right if there are no more questions i want to thank everybody for joining and as i mentioned we did record or we are recording this session so we will let you know or if you need to know how to get to it you can uh, send a note to info@uslearning.com and we'll be more than happy to make this available to you or your friends and uh, just a plug for uso so if you did like what you heard today please tell your friends who might be looking for help Uh, for us to guide them and if they're in 12th grade obviously it's time to apply if they're in 11th or 10th or whatever it's never too early to ask yourself the question how do i choose the right college for me okay thank you very much again and uh take care good night